Okay, so welcome everyone. Thank you for coming and thank you for waiting. Um, it's nice to see you all here. Um, so we're about to welcome to the stage three Hackney residents who have been working over the past month to create their own lectures on issues important to Hackney and other young people who live in the borough. Um, they've been working tremendously hard over the past month to produce these. We've met up every Wednesday um, and we've done a variety of workshops. So they have been trained by expert communication coaches. Um, they've taken photographs, which you can see over there of the local area. Um, and they've been doing their own qualitative and quantitative research to put together their speeches. Um, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure working with all three of them and seeing the speeches that they've put together is really, really exciting because all three of them have come together really, yeah, really lovely. Um, so yeah, I think we'll get started and we're going to welcome to the stage first of all Chanel from Bridge Academy, who's going to be speaking about gentrification. <laughs> okay. Hi, as Marie said, my name is Chanel Smith and I'll be talking about the processes of gentrification and who are the people we're leaving behind during the process. Where were the broken fragments of my culture that has been dismantled by the ethnocentric culture where we call home? With the streets of Rudy Market being the gates to the access for my culture where I can celebrate my culture traditions of food that I would not access before? Without the feeling that I've been put into another section of African and Caribbean with implements of the world section where they put African and Caribbean like those two collide. Well, what is gentrification? Gentrification is the process of transforming a neighbourhood's character by bringing in more affluent individuals and businesses. The economic growth or worth of the community is frequently increased um, through gentrification but the resultant demographic displacement can cause crucial issues of itself. Well, um, when people are mostly looking at gentrification, they mostly look at statistics and graphs, but I like to look at the social impact and who are these people that it's endangering. Malachi gives us an eyewitness account of how gentrification radically altered his experience of growing up in Hackney. I remember a time not so long ago when the utterance of a place Hackney drew a look of sympathetic concern of a conceding with a false smile that read, I'm sorry you have to go through that, as if living in the borough was synonymous with suffering with continuous traumatic stress. The stark lack of integration between old and new communities in Hackney hugely contributed to the feeling of no longer feeling home walking down the streets. This is then a problem. If we can't feel home where we used to call home, where do we reside? Well, that's what conviviality is. With the meaning of conviviality in simple terms, being the capacity of people to connect with and people independently and creatively with others and their surroundings in order to meet each other's needs. As Gilroy states, conviviality refers to the process of cohabitation and interaction that is made in multicultural and ordinary features of social life in Britain and urban areas and post-colonial cities elsewhere. This isn't necessarily a factor in, com in contemporary processes in the, of urban regeneration and gentrification and the attendant forms of displacement in cities like London. These forms of displacement and exclusion should then be connected in the heavy policing and surveillance that over dominate the lives of so many working class young people and black racialized and young people in particular. Well, what's happening to Ridley Market as my focal point of this lecture? Well, in simple terms, without trying to sweeten up and make it sound better, it's the real truth behind gentrification and taking away people's culture, taking away people's homes and taking away people's truth. The campaign Save Ridley Road aims to raise alarm and um, over potential impact of Hackney Council's Dawson plan, the viability of Ridley Road Market as they put in the plans to build almost 500 new residents on the site of Kingsland Road Shopping Centre will irrevocably alter the character of Dawson as a whole. Aside from the so cultural and social ramifications, of losing a local street market and luxury housing. These plans, then if these plans are then all over London. We can see it. Let's not lie to ourselves that like we can't see gentrification happening all over around us. If we live in London, if we, even if we live in Hackney. 
Well, what's Hackney Council's definition of Ridley Market? Ridley Market has been home to Ridley Market has been home in the heart of Dawson for over 50 years, having started with 20 stores and now playing an important role in Hackney's history heritage, with over 150 stores offering a diverse range in quality goods and competitive prices. Well, what is the history of Ridley Market? Ridley Market has been serving the diverse communities of Hackney's in East London since the 1800s, according to the fourth generation market trader. Larry Julian as a continuous change in every decade. Well, let's not lie to ourselves and be ignorant that crime is a very important factor in London, especially in Hackney. Could gentrification solve really markets crime problem? We have found 463 crimes in September 2022 alone. This is a very scary number. 463 crimes alone in one month. We cannot ignore this problem like it doesn't exist. Well, let's look deeper into this. What are the benefits of gentrification? Gentrification is a sign of economic growth as money begins to flow in the neighborhood and the aspect of everyday life. Jobs are changed for the better. Also, interlinking back with crime, Hackney is among one of the top five dangerous boroughs in London. The overall crime rate in 2021 was 105 crimes per 1,000 person. This is very dangerous, but is gentrification the so is gentrification does gentrification will gentrification solve this i don't think so i don't think gentrification will solve this issue i don't think gentrification will take away crime but it will take away people's lives and take away people's culture let's look at people who make really market let's make, let's look at people who make really market home robert my mum and dad, Marvis and Charles, came here from Ghana in the 1980s to find a better life. Ridley Road has its history from way back. If this road is generation and for the generations, however, it's for generations to come to know that this road has always stayed the same as it is today. Do you understand? Dennis, I'm a Kingstonian, born in Kingston, Jamaica. I came to this country in 1961. I felt privileged to be here and meet new people. We lived all over London, but my main home was Hackney. I, go, I got into boxing at a young age whilst attending a basket weaving workshop in Hackney. People on Ridley Road still call me out, hey champ, what's up boxer? And pay, it pays me a privilege. It's a space where I feel comfortable and I can be myself. The road is a part of an Afro-Caribbean community. And lastly, Sonia. I like to offer natural goodness to the people of Ridley Road, which I believe is a nectar from the gods. To be standing as a working class single mother, running my own business and holding my own makes me feel proud. I'm pleased to stand up for myself as someone of mixed race. I think Ridley Road has helped me understand my own heritage. In conclusion, what can we do? Join Save Ridley Road. Save Ridley Road is a coalition of groups and individuals who work and live all shop and the market and who want to come together to ensure any, any change takes place. We can expose developers' application, and this can be as simply as posting on Facebook or using the hashtag Save, Live, Save Ridley Road. Being here and being able to have open communications about the gentrification going on. Also, maybe even going to Ridley Market yourself and looking at it and just really enjoying the culture. We are not only here to Save Ridley Market for ourselves, but for the next generation after us. Thank you for listening. And yeah. <laughs> okay so thanks so much Chanel that was absolutely amazing um, I hope everybody learned a bit about gentrification and you're all going to join the Save Ridley Road campaign um, and next up we've got Maria um, Maria is a student at Clapton Girls Academy and she's going to be talking about social media <laughs> Thank you all for coming here today and taking the time out of your busy schedules to join me and my fellows talk about what we think is important. I'd like to start by asking where, how you got yourselves here today. What directions did you use or where did you get your directions from? Anybody? On your phone? Okay. Google Maps? Okay. Did we all use Google Maps? Yeah, me too. 
isn't it amazing how isn't our phones and our devices just the most amazing things we can take pictures we can record audio we can record video and every single piece of public information known to humankind is just a click away and they can also call people which is great <laughs> What many studies are showing is that one of the main things we're using our devices for is, sorry, <laughs> one of the main things we're using our devices for is escapism. Now, escapism, Merriam-Webster's definition, is habitual diversion of the mind to purely imaginative activity or entertainment as an escape from reality or routine. This basically means to me um, to be somebody else, to be somewhere else for a temporary amount of time in order to escape here and now. Does anybody else relate to this in any way? Yeah. Um, a common forms of escapism is some of my favorite things. Um, movies and TV shows, your Netflix shows, YouTube, which you can go down rabbit holes at two o'clock in the morning, games, um, TikTok, which just keeps going. Well, has anybody actually got to the end of the feed on, t on TikTok? No, I <laughs> <laughs> There are some other examples. Um, music, a lot of people find that that's a great form of escapism. You could feel one way and then you can listen to a song and you can feel a completely different way, which is quite, my, quite, quite crazy. Um, sports especially, which not only is great for your physical well-being, but emotionally you feel determined, you feel teamwork, and yeah, it's great. Virtual reality, which I cannot afford, but many people have said it's quite amazing. Um, and trust your Bob Ross, who <laughs> has taught many of us art during lockdown, and yeah, art is another form of escapism. So escapism is quite beneficial if we use it smartly. It can be a form of self-care where we, it helps to prevent burnout and re-energize us. Um, but why is it that we keep going back to escapism and keep returning and keep wanting to go run away from what we're doing now to do something else? Well, there's a whole science behind it. It's because of escapism or escape is part of our fight and flight defense mechanism. It's part of our alternate nervous system, which responds to stressful situations. And so when a stressful occurrence happens, our body automatically, unconsciously, begins to give us an energy boost, releases adrenaline, our blood pressure rises, and so we can either fight off our issues or we could run away from them. And escape from, it doesn't seem that drastic, but we unconsciously do it because it's innate. Well, if we're continuously escaping, what does that mean? How does our resilience look? Is it weakening? Is it, I'm not, how would it look in the long term? Could escapism turn into procrastination and avoidance if we continuously do it long term? Using escapism in things like social media, where we receive notifications and likes and comments, they re make us receive a dopamine and serotonin boost. So dopamine and serotonin are neurotransmitters, hormones, which are sent to our brain, which our brain sees as positive reinforcement. And so if we continuously receive dopamine and serotonin, we are constantly happy and energized, but then when it begins to fade away, we crave for more natural response. And so we continue to scroll and we mindlessly just continue and continue and watch our movies and so we can continuously feel this validation. And that is why it's really addictive. Also, studies in America, the many fancy universities like Stanford, they have found that the, the, our response to notifications and likes and things like that have a similar, is similar to the response people have received from cocaine use. And so 
that should show why it's really addictive. And I mean, people go to extreme lengths for this sort of validation. Who else has taken a picture of five or six times before we posted it? Um, like, of, I don't know, like a salad or a sunset and chose the right, the best one before we, the best quality one. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> so if we continuously posted amazing pictures and just the best of times, and we kept seeing people's best of times, how much of that was really real? I mean, there's a saying, the, the grass is greener on the other side, but really, what if it's just been spray painted? I mean, <laughs> how, much of it, how much of that grass is really fresh and amazing, and how much of what, of what we're seeing is really true? And if we continuously see all these really happy people, um, you know, graduation, going on holiday with, yeah, um, and just seeing all these familiar faces, having the best of times, doing the best of things, and moving on with their lives, this could lead to feelings of jealousy. But, main, but also, most importantly, FOMO. <laughs> so this is the fear of missing out, the fear of being left alone, forgotten, and by yourself, isolated. Has anybody else felt FOMO ever in their lives? Yeah. Just looking at Harry over there just makes me feel sad. <laughs> oh, yeah. So this feeling, for me personally, makes me feel like I am sort of just pulling myself together just to get through the day rather than actually enjoying what I'm doing, feeling completely forgotten. And the funny thing is, I'm not alone, and people who have felt FOMO have, are also not alone. London is one of the most loneliest cities in the, in the UK, especially after lockdown. I mean, try talking to somebody on the bus or on the train. Trust me, they'll think you're a weirdo, and, it's, and especially if you're like me and start waving. Yeah, <laughs> it's not great, but that's just an example of how London is very by themselves, and everybody seems to have their own social groups, but stay by themselves. And so if we're continuously feeling forgotten, this could lead to compulsive checking on our phone, just to check if, oh, somebody might message me, or, or did this, this, this person post their thing, or da, da, da. If this continuously happens to us, how would this affect young people? The brain continues to develop until the age of 25. And so if young people, people under the age of 25, are um, continuously overstimulated and, hyper, and receive hypervigilance uh, hyper and are continuously stimulated by notifications and videos. And if you watch a video today most of, on YouTube, most of them will be crazy shouting just so they can you know, gain your energy. Um, what does this do to a young mind? Um, and what, and no, what, not only would this affect Oh, sorry. Um, so constantly receiving and bombarding a young child with overstimulating content can be quite detrimental. And if they're constantly using, seeing all this content by themselves, this could lead to feelings of social anxiety symptoms in the future, which increases the likelihood of them being isolated and feeling quite frightened of being with other people. And who, and also, who, does anybody use their phone before they sleep, or is that the last thing they check? Um, I do. Yeah? <laughs> this is a, re is a, increases the likelihood of disrupting your sleep and making you have a less quality, less quality sleep. And so you're, you're more likely to feel tired throughout the day and not be your best self. And if the, these young people, they have an online identity, or maybe they don't and they keep, keep their information private, but they are able to access all this explicit content. And so they, a lot of them are quite easily influenced, especially with things like swearing, if there isn't like a report sign or anything like that, that could stop young people see swearing. But a lot of them would see swearing or... Um, things that could really negatively influence their behaviour. And many, many young people are starting to alter their behaviour and appearance in order to fit in. And 
this has led to adultification of young children, or this is increasing the likelihood of adultification in young children. For example, um, somebody asked me if they could they send me something on Snapchat, and I said, oh, sorry, I don't have Snapchat. And they were like, you don't have Snapchat? How do you communicate with people? And I said, I don't know, I like to see people rather than see people, but sure. So, peop the average amount of times we use, uh, three hours and 23 minutes is the average amount of time we're using on our phones in this very room. And so this could lead to 50 days a year of us just being on our phones. And for 16 to 24 year olds, that's increased to 60 days a year. And so that is around 11 years of your life used on a phone or a device. I mean, what, sorry, um, so this is ways you could check your screen time. Um, you could do that afterwards if you want. Um, okay. What do you see yourself doing in 10 years time? Does anybody want to answer? <laughs> oh, okay, it's fine. Um, so in... <laughs> If I look, oh, oh sorry, um, 10 years ago, I thought I'd be doing this and that, or I don't know, maybe, well, I saw, saw myself in this position, being a year 13 student, um, but nothing major, maybe I'd like fly a plane and live in the, live in the moon or something, but <laughs> that hasn't happened yet. And let's take a smaller scale. What did you want to accomplish by the end of 2022? Can, did anybody, set any New Year's resolutions and n not actually complete any of them yet? Yeah, me too. I mean, if I look back at January, I wanted to become head girl. And so I, wanted, I followed the, head, the previous head girl around. I asked her so many questions, you know, try to get into her good books so you know, I can learn from her. Um, and so unfortunately, unfortunately, I didn't become head girl, but I took a step in the right direction and became a prefect instead. So that's good. Thank you. Um, okay. um, so when, so when I was mindlessly scrolling on my phone, I came across this BBC article for, would you swap your smartphone with a brick phone? And I thought, nobody's going to do that. And so I showed my teacher, and we saw, read through, we watched the video and read through the article, and we thought, let's take a twist on this. Let's give up social media for two weeks. So it came from 30 students, given, 13, 16 year olds w giving up their phone. By the end of it, it was only five people who completed the, completed our little test. And what we found is that many of us felt FOMO. But we saved a lot of time and we actually got our work done. And even though we were quite depressed because we were, <laughs> we were experiencing withdrawal systems. But anyways, we, get, we gave it a go and half of that so a good three people decided let's carry on and see how how far we can go so they gave up their snapchats and i gave up instagram and netflix and yeah i saw that i had a lot more time on my hands um but felt very out of the loop and so that encouraged me to go and ask people what they were doing with their lives and so i talked to more people and yeah i made some good friends from that what you could be doing instead is number one we could all be sleeping more. We could also be protesting and making change in our communities. We could be, and we could also be taking a step in the right direction to achieve new goals. And so we only have one month left of 2022. We could, let's start planning for 2023 and think of the goal you want to achieve. What we're going to do in your own times is you're going to take, think of the smaller steps you need to take to achieve that goal by the end of 2023. You could also do a digital detox, which is basically reducing the amount of time, hours you're spending on social media and Netflix, or complete it, completely cut it out from your life for a short amount of time, just so you can recharge yourself. Our goals will, see, will seem much more closer and so we could 
achieve them much more um, easier if we take up the smaller steps to complete them. And let's, com let's try and make 2023 a more effective, a more amazing year than 2022 um, before the clock stops ticking. And what Dumbledore, Professor Dumbledore would say is, it does not do to dwell on dreams, Harry, and forget to live. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Maria. Um, I hope after everyone seeing that horrible statistic that we spend 10 years of our life on our phone, um, that we want to get rid of them. Um, okay, and now we're going to welcome Jess to our stage, which is doing our final presentation. Um, Academic success in Hackney. It's wonderful, right? The glorious transition from educational deprivation to now achieving some of the best academic grades in London. Well, all is not what it seems. Believe it or not, there are ch challenges presented as a result of Hackney's rapid academic success. These include the increase of gentrification in Hackney schools, school exclusions, and the racial stereotyping of black students. Although Hackney claims to be one of the most diverse boroughs in London, it does not do enough to support, support its young people. First of all, what is gentrification? According to the National Geographic Society, gentrification describes a process where wealthy, educated individuals begin to move into poor or working class communities, often occupied by people of colour. This suggests that gentrification influences the outcomes of schools either becoming academically successful or not. This leaves the schools in London that are deemed inadequate or requires, fun, requires improvement, reducing the funds to address educational attainment. Not only does this happen in Hackney, but in many surrounding boroughs in London. Gentrification in Hackney favours the white, middle class, affluent families who can use their resources to secure the top spots within schools that have an austere reputation of outstanding. If we compare the demographics walking into schools with different reputations, we can clearly see the difference. But what can we tell from this? That ethnic minority students are disproportionately affected by gentrification. They're the ones who are unlikely to get into the high achieving schools as they want to make way for the other students, who we all know are those stereotypically deemed more academic, academically successful than others. It is commonly known that ex expulsion disproportionately affects black students, especially black males, more than any other ethnic group. So, question to the audience, could anyone tell me the driving factor behind why black students are most likely to get expelled? Anyone in the audience? That is correct. Racism. Racism is a virus that contaminates all aspects of society and schools are no exception. Black students have been given the worst reputation when it comes to school exclusions more than any other ethnic group. But let us not forget we cannot generalise black students into one, as they are young Africans and Caribbeans alike. Young black Caribbeans are four times more likely than their white counterparts to receive fixed term expulsions. Whilst white students are reprimanded for detentions and community services, black students have been given up on within Hackney's educational system, leaving them to go to PRU units. Those who go to these units are one step away to going to prison, leading to the negative stereotypes of black students being the main cause of youth violence and life crime. These racial stereotyping of black students leaves them feeling like they're, they're not acknowledged in, a, in an educational system that is supposed to be helping them reach their academic potential. 
approximately 49% of young black people feel that racism is the biggest barrier when it comes to attaining success in school, whilst 50% say the biggest barrier is the teacher's perceptions of them. Have you ever felt invisible in front of your teachers? Have you ever felt like you couldn't stand up for yourself because you may be stereotyped as aggressive or disruptive? Have you ever felt like the whole educational system is rigged against you through sets being racially stereotyped, lack of opportunities, police checks leading to harassment, expulsions? <sighs> That's a lot. But I'm guessing from the audience, most of you haven't. <laughs> So for this next activity, I'll be showcasing, showcasing the racial stereotypes interactions between a teacher and a student. And I'll need two volunteers for this. And remember, this is only role play. And we know that no one has any negative feelings towards each other. Anyone care to volunteer? My sister. And anyone else? Hey. So I'll be handing you some scripts to read. Um, you can be the teacher. And you can be the student again. Uh, oh no, you can just stand like that, it's fine. So you can read the scripts and they, um, make a conversation based off of it. Read the script. Based off based a conversation off the script prompts I've given you. Oh, miss, this book's just really long. Yeah. I don't like it. Um, are you able to read it properly or do you understand? Yeah, it's just really long. How many chapters? I don't know. There's what? One, two, three, four, five chapters. Uh, do you... Th would you like if I'll sit down with you to read it? Or? No, I'd like if it just wasn't so long and annoying. Oh, I can't help it. That's what's that's been assigned for the class. Pause. Many black, many, many stu Oh, you can sit down now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Round of applause, everyone. <laughs> many food students feel like they cannot reach their full academic potential and be part of the educational growth that Hackney is popularised for. Here are some statements from RISE 365, interviews where young people discuss their experiences with racism and how it intersects deeply within, the, within their lives. I just keep my head down at school and play the game, so I'm not my authentic self. But sometimes you have to be more professional in certain situations so you can progress. I worry that if I am myself, I might be judged or stereotyped. Schools should be more than just about education. There should, be a, there should be people who can relate to, who understand our cultures and our life experiences and how these impact us. Black people need more visibility and the system could support black cultures and communities. I have known this internally my whole life. But it's messed up that I have to change who I am to make other people feel comfortable. It makes you feel like you've done something wrong. How do you change that? Well, there are tons of brilliant ways on how we can combat, combat the academic gap between black students and the wider demographic. This can be done through peer-to-peer -peer support. Having a support system within schools will have a huge effect for black students as it allows them to talk about their circumstances that they may be facing in school or at home. Decolonizing the curric curriculum, adding black cultures and famous people within the curriculum, providing greater aspirations for black students to aspire to and realize that they can fulfill their academic potential. Racial training for teachers. This will assist in reducing the unconscious biases that happen amongst teachers and finally realising that black students can achieve, have, deserve the same opportunities as those of their white counterparts. It's not working, never mind. Free resources. This will provide the greater stability in, the, in their lives, therefore making it easier for them to focus on their academic work. For example, 
For shy pre who, who, who provides free resources to dis disadvantaged students, such as mentoring, family support and coaching. He's truly a vital figure for those. I know what you guys must be thinking. Jessica, this is a lot of information for us to absorb. Well, I'm not going to apologise, as I think it's, an, it's, it's essential to bring awareness to these issues surrounding educational attainment in Hackney, so that we, and most importantly, the Hackney Council, if you're watching this, hello, <laughs> <laughs> can ponder over ways to create a fairer, more equal academic ground for all students in Hackney's care. And this is the key to academic success. Thank you for listening to my presentation and have a nice day. Okay, I think we're just going to round out by saying once again, thank you for coming and one big round of applause for Chanel, Maria and Jess who have just continually... <laughs> um, yeah, I hope you walk away from this feeling that you've learned something about some important issues in Heckney. Um, and yeah, I'll leave you all to have a lovely evening. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for coming. <laughs>